Ricky, Joe, and Curtis were neighbors and friends living in Kenai, Alaska. When they were all off from work, their favorite hobby together was going fishing for salmon in the Kenai River. This day, they're going to the Kenai River again to go fishing for salmon. Even if they had done it many times, they still wanted to hang out with each other by going fishing together. As they reached the banks of the Kenai River, Joe prepared three portable chairs to relax in when they weren't fishing. Curtis prepared some food and beer while Ricky prepared their fishing rods to be used when they were about to go fishing in a little while. The three sat on their portable chairs first while they made a toast and ate food while chatting. The three of them were having a great time as this was also their way to relax after a hard week working for their families. After eating and drinking for a while, they decided to go to the river and start fishing for salmon. They grabbed their fishing rods and went into the shallow river to start fishing. The Kenai River is always abundant with salmon, so they would all have a good catch when they're done. A few minutes passed and the three decided to rest while looking at the salmon they caught. They all shared a drink again and ate food before continuing to fish. But this time, they were confused about why they almost caught no salmon. Curtis concluded that maybe a bear was hunting for salmon in the river nearby. Ricky and Joe grew concerned as the three decided to return to the riverbank once more and rest instead. They decided to stay for another hour to see if they could catch another batch of salmon once they went to the water again. As they were resting, Ricky told Joe and Curtis that he wanted to check if there were salmon in the river again, to which the two agreed. Ricky waded through the shallow water to the slightly deeper part of the river, with a water level far above his knees. He wanted to see if there were any salmon or any other fish he could catch and bring home later. As Ricky searched for fish with his rod, a grizzly bear was silently lurking in the waters just around him. Joe and Curtis were busy drinking and talking to each other. That's why they couldn't see the grizzly bear beside Ricky at the river. Ricky decided to go back to the riverbank when he saw the grizzly bear beside him. He instinctively screamed and tried to run through the water, but it was too late. The bear immediately grabbed him by the shoulders and bit his arm, which made him scream louder than before, which Joe and Curtis had heard just now. Joe and Curtis were shocked as they could see their friend Ricky getting attacked and bitten by a grizzly bear in the river. They immediately stood up from their portable chairs and rushed to the river as they began to punch and kick the bear to rescue Ricky. The bear kept biting at Ricky's arm as it started scratching Joe's face with its claw. Blood dripped from Joe's wound on his face, but this didn't stop him. Joe and Curtis continued to punch the bear while making loud noises so that it would let go of Ricky's arm. After a few punches and kicks, Curtis found the right timing and stretched his arms out to gouge the grizzly bear's eyes with his hands, which made the bear ball out in pain and run away from them immediately, leaving the three of them bloodied in the river. Curtis helped his two wounded friends, Ricky and Joe, to get inside their vehicle and get medical help. Ricky miraculously survived even after suffering a large bite wound on his arm, while Joe had to rest for a while and get treatments for the injury on his face. After the incident, they don't know if they can continue with their favorite hobby or start finding a new one that would cause them no harm. Professor Archer Harris is a wildlife biologist at a university in Alaska. Today, he and his college students were having an educational trip to a hiking trail in Alaska, as he will be teaching them about the wildlife there. The educational trip will involve him and his students on a four-day camp that will be held at a specified campground near the hiking trail. The students were tasked to record and take note of everything they'll learn on the trip and will later on use their knowledge to assess themselves on the subject. Archer and his 18 students in the class prepared their sleeping bags and belongings in their camp before they could get to the hiking trail. Everyone was enthusiastic about the trip as they were curious about how diverse this place's wildlife would be. After the preparations, Archer gathered the students as they set off to the hiking trail they were all excited about. As soon as they arrived at the place, 
everyone was busy taking notes and documenting the site with photos and videos, while Archer taught them about everything in the wild. They all hiked into the trail, while Archer spoke about everything he knew about the wild until they reached a small creek. The students were given a short break as they took turns exploring the creek and its surroundings. As the students were busy exploring and taking footage of everything they could find, a young black bear suddenly appeared on the other side of the creek, causing some students to freak out and panic. When Archer noticed this, he immediately rushed to the students and told them to calm down. Afterward, he suddenly made loud noises that easily scared the black bear away from the creek. The students were amazed by how Archer scared the bear off. One student, Avery, asked about how he did that and why bears are easily frightened by loud noises. Archer found this an interesting question as he began teaching about bears. The students were all drawn to his discussion as they started taking notes with their phones once again, while Archer also discussed his lesson very well with the students. However, the students all heard a rustling sound just behind Archer, which stopped him from talking. When the rustling sound stopped, Archer continued teaching the students his knowledge about bears. As everything was going so well, none of them knew what would happen a few seconds from now. As Archer was busy talking, the rustling sound could be heard again, and in a split second, a massive pair of claws appeared behind the professor and grabbed him by the torso, dragging him deep into the bushes at the creekside. The students all gasped and later on screamed in panic as Archer was pulled into a place where none of them knew. Avery and two other boys named Kyler and Simon rushed to the bushes to go and chase whatever grabbed their professor. And when they got into a meadow, they saw a giant grizzly bear on top of Archer, clawing his face and biting his arm. The three of them were surprised as they just saw a black bear earlier, but now it was a giant grizzly bear that was bigger and more aggressive. The grizzly bear continued to bite and claw Archer as the professor struggled to use his arms to shield his face and neck from the attacker. He screamed in pain as the bear put all of its weight on it while scratching all over his body. Avery remembered that grizzly bears are also easily disturbed by loud noises, so he, Kyler, and Simon decided to clap their hands and make noises as loud as they could. However, this didn't startle the bear at all, but he grew more aggressive towards Archer. Archer was now screaming in excruciating pain and had blood all over his body. So Avery thought of another way to scare the bear off their professor. Simon picked up some huge stones from the ground and threw one at the bear, which made the animal flinch. Realizing that it worked, Avery and Kyler picked up stones to throw at the grizzly while also making loud noises, and kept doing it until it decided to run away from them. There, Archer was left severely wounded and bloodied on the ground. The three boys worked together to help the professor as they hiked back into their campground and gave him first aid for his wounds. After that, the students decided to call the authorities and get emergency help while the other officials took care of the bear that attacked Archer. Malcolm is a young mountain biker. He usually goes out to bike alone or with fellow mountain bikers on biking trails across Montana. Today he'll be mountain biking with a bunch of his close friends from their mountain biking group on another biking trail in Montana. They'll also have a camp in the nearest campground so they can relax and eventually enjoy spending some time together after their ride. While biking, Malcolm and his other friends recorded their surroundings in case there was wildlife on the road. They've been doing this every time they go out to bike because they also love to see animals on their way. After a few minutes of continuous mountain biking, Malcolm and his friends decided to stop by the roadside with trees surrounding it. They took time to rest and enjoy seeing all the sights around them. When they were done resting, they decided to bike again to their campground, which was still a couple of kilometers away. This didn't bother them since they all enjoyed biking everywhere. Everything went so well until Malcolm and his friends heard rustling from one of the trees above. One of his friends told him that it was just a bird, while the others said to him that maybe it was just the wind. They stopped for a while to see if the rustling sound continued. The rustling sound stopped for a moment, but before they could all feel relieved, a black bear surprisingly jumped from a tree and landed on top of Malcolm, 
taking him to the ground and breaking his bike. His friends were also surprised as the black bear began violently attacking Malcolm by clawing his face and biting his head aggressively. Malcolm couldn't move in his place due to his back getting hurt from the bear's fall, and that's why he was screaming in pain while his friends stared at him in panic and not knowing what to do. One of his friends headed to the road to find help, while the others were thinking of a way to get the bear away from him. Malcolm tried to push the bear away from him, but it didn't work. The bear kept attacking him until his face got slashed by its claw, damaging his eye. One of his friends picked up a wooden stick to smash the bear, while the others threw stones at the bear. One of his friends, who biked away from them to get help, immediately arrived with the authorities. As they tranquilized the bear, and rescued Malcolm from getting mauled even further. After the attack, Malcolm and his friends were taken to the hospital while the authorities decided what to do with the bear after the incident. Malcolm suffered an injury to his back and his eye, while severe wounds were all over his body. It was a miracle that he survived, but it will take him many weeks to recover after all he went through. Our first tale takes us to the mountainous ranges of Bosnia and Herzegovina in 2013. It's a small country in the Balkans, famous for its friendly people, breathtaking nature, and excellent food. When it comes to the heart of Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is characteristically diverse. It includes many different species of animals, from wolves to foxes to elk and bears much to the dismay of the first person we want to talk about. 46-year-old Herzegovinian shepherd Mirko Primorak was tending to his flock of sheep in the field near his house in Verba, a small village in the municipality of Gako on the eastern side of the country. Mirko was doing his business, resting in the shade of a tree as his flock enjoyed the grass and got some exercise in the warm weather. Things were seemingly going well until he noticed some commotion a few dozen yards from the tree. A young brown bear attacked his sheep, and when it saw Mirko, it began charging him. In a moment of fear and adrenaline, all Mirko managed to pull out from his pocket was a small hatchet he had with him, so he braced for the pain to come. The bear eventually got close, and Mirko fought with all he had against the bear as it took him to the ground. It bit his forearm and cemented its paw on his chest, preventing him from getting up. Eventually, pain and desperation set in as he abandoned his hatchet and tried to grab hold of the bear's throat. Mirko was a strong man, accustomed to working in the field all his life, but his hands were barely enough to deter the bear for even a second. His saving grace was his loyal Tornyak dog running up and biting the bear wherever he could. Tornyak dogs are native to Bosnia and Herzegovina and are characteristically large, protective, and powerful when defending the ones close to them. His wife Mira ran out of the house, banging pots together and screaming, trying to scare the bear away. According to what Mirko remembered in the incident, the bear eventually loosened its bite on Mirko's arm and backed away into the woods, chased by the dog. Medical assistance arrived shortly after, while Mirko's wife bandaged him up as much as she could, and he ended up in the news as one of the only people in the area to have been attacked by a bear and lived to tell the tale. Due to the trauma of the incident, the story can only be pieced together by Mirko's memories and what his wife saw when she came to help. But it's fair to say that what happened was nothing short of miraculous. Mirko got away from the incident with deep scars on his arm broken ribs and multiple cuts, but he said he would always be thankful for being alive and gaining bragging rights for fighting off a bear. Married couple Caden and Jade, along with their 16-month-old daughter Chloe, were on their way to a camping site in British Columbia using their motorized RV. The couple spent years saving up for their motorized RV because they enjoy traveling and want to experience comfortable living away from home. They also wanted their daughter to experience the joys of traveling, even if she just recently turned a year old. They want Chloe to learn to love traveling as much as they do. As they arrived at the campground, Caden parked the RV just near the lake as Jade and Chloe went outside to walk and take some pictures. 
Chloe was visibly happy with what she saw. The couple was delighted to see their little daughter happy. Jay then went a few meters away near the lake to place Chloe on the ground as the little girl was learning how to walk. She then turns her camera on to record the little girl and take pictures of her while attempting to walk by taking a few steps forward. Caden sees his daughter and smiles at the sight of her trying to walk. Jade then calls Chloe by her name and motivates her to walk even more while recording it on camera. As Jade watched Chloe walk, Caden told his wife that he would arrange their belongings, including the portable chairs and grillers, so they could start with their camping experience, to which Jade agreed. Chloe falls to the ground several times, but Jade always encourages her to stand up and help herself walk. Jade then calls Caden and tells him that he needs to make some milk for Chloe, which the husband immediately obeys the second he hears. Jade then focused on Chloe, but she couldn't figure out why the little girl was pointing to something in the woods. Chloe, not knowing how to speak complete sentences yet, repeatedly utters the words, Mommy, and teddy bear as she keeps pointing at whatever she sees in the woods. Jane was quite alarmed when Chloe couldn't stop uttering teddy bear, so she looked closely into the woods and was surprised by what she saw. It was a grizzly bear just behind a tree near their RV. Jane was so terrified that she picked Chloe up, but it was too late. The bear suddenly growled, leaped out from behind the tree, and attacked Jane and Chloe. Jane fell to the ground with her arms wrapped around little Chloe. The bear started to bite and scratch her back as she screamed for her husband, who was busy cooking inside their RV. When Caden heard his wife shout, he immediately got out of the vehicle and screamed in horror at what he saw. Chloe was crying as the bear aggressively growled while attacking Jane. Despite being hurt, Jane used herself to protect Chloe from the bear as she hugged the little girl tightly into her arms. Chloe was crying out loud as the bear still attacked Jane by scratching her back with its sharp claws and biting her head. Caden went inside their RV and grabbed the stun baton he'd been bringing everywhere to protect him and his wife as they traveled. He bravely goes near the bear and aims the stun baton at its neck before turning it on and electrocuting it. The bear growled in pain while flinching and decided to run away back to the woods where it came from. Jane was crying as she still held Chloe tightly into her arms. Caden was also crying as he helped his wife and daughter stand up from the ground to go to the nearest hospital. Jane suffered severe wounds on her back and head while Chloe survived without a scratch. Caden thanked Jane for protecting their daughter and promised that he'll do better in looking after them next time. Our third story is set in Koryaki, Kamchatka and concerns Dominic Semenov, a Russian miner who was attacked by two giant black bears and lived to tell the tale. Kamchatka is notorious for being unforgiving and harsh especially when you go to the southern peninsula, where the bear population is solid and plentiful. It also has a powerful mining system maintained by men like Dominic, who have to spend days in the wilderness surrounded by miles of nothing. Dominic Semenov arrived at his post on January 14th as a surface level worker, where he observed the project and ensured that everything was going according to plan. He and his colleagues worked through the minus 15 Celsius weather and harsh snow for the entire day, but not everything went according to plan. At one point in the day, Semenov noticed movement near their post, not 100 yards from where he and his crew were working. It was two giant black bears. Bears usually never came close to humans in Kamchatka, mainly because they naturally fear them and tend to hunt in more remote regions. However, this case was strange because these bears did not seem scared or curious. They sat at the edge of Semenov's post and observed them. The crew had rifles for emergency purposes, but as long as the bears remained at bay, there was no need to be violent. Indeed, the bears never made moves toward the post, eventually moving out of sight and out of mind. The crew was used to seeing bears now and then, and they usually just left the team alone and did their business. Dominic stayed late that night to oversee some site logistics, so he was the last to leave. Once done, he made his way to his car on the vacant site lot where everyone parked their cars.
About 10 yards before he reached his car, he noticed a sound coming from his left, from the tree line where he initially saw the bears. They were back and steadily moving towards him, obviously hungry and menacing. He froze in place, realizing all he had to defend himself from the animals was a heavy toolbox, and his car was too far away to get there in time. One bear advanced before the other, and as it got closer, it also got faster, eventually going into a charge at Dominic. Instinctively, he swung the toolbox at the bear's head. He missed. The box narrowly missed the bear's head and hit its shoulder, staggering it slightly. The box dropped to the ground, and he broke into a dead sprint toward his unlocked car. Unfortunately, his escape would not be that simple, as the second bear caught up and grabbed his leg, slowing him down. He fought with all he had, gouging its eyes until it let go. He managed to slip into his car at the last second. Out of shock, he curled up in the seat and watched the bears run off, eventually falling asleep after he calmed down. His crew found him in the morning, slightly scratched up, but alive. The company put a fence around the site within the same week. It's almost summer season, and it's 15-year-old summer's favorite time of the year. Today, she'll gather her cousins for backyard camping, since it's their favorite thing to do at this time. She gathered her cousins Lorenzo, Kevin, Kylie, and Abel at her house in Virginia. They all started to plan their activities and everything they'll do for their backyard camping. Since they're all young, they can't go to an actual national park to camp, so they decided to do it here in Summer's backyard. After hours of thorough planning, Summer and her cousins start setting up their camp. They set up their sleeping bags, a campfire, and a place to grill and make food. They all waited until night to go to the backyard to start camping. When they reached the backyard, Summer and Kylie began grilling meat, while Lorenzo, Kevin, and Abel helped set up one large makeshift tent if somebody wanted to sleep in a tent and not in their sleeping bag. With everything set up, Summer and Kylie finished grilling the meat and served it to the others seated around the campfire. Everyone was having a great time and enjoyed their time together, even if they only had a camp in the backyard. A couple of hours passed and all of them decided to go to sleep. Summer, Kylie, and Lorenzo decided to sleep in their sleeping bags, while Kevin and Abel decided to sleep in the makeshift tent. It was a cold summer night and they all seemed comfortable with their spots in the backyard. While sleeping, Summer unexpectedly woke up in the middle of the night as she had had a bad dream. She was breathing heavily until she suddenly felt relieved when realizing that it was indeed just a dream. Summer got out of her sleeping bag to free her legs and feel the cold air as she continued to sleep. Minutes later, she felt something heavy crushing her leg. It was dark in the backyard, and the only light was from the campfire, so she couldn't tell who or what was on her leg then. Summer tried shaking her legs, but got almost crushed by the heavy person or creature on top of it. As she took a closer look, she freaked out, realizing it was an adult black bear. She screamed loud enough for her other sleeping cousins to wake up, but when they did, it seemed that it was too late. The bear began to bite Summer's leg while clawing the other, and Summer screamed in pain while trying to kick the bear with her other free leg. Lorenzo and Kylie immediately got out of their sleeping bags as Kevin and Abel did while they tried to think of a way to save their cousin from the bear. Summer kept shaking her body to try to escape the bear, but it got more aggressive and started dragging her away by her leg. Lorenzo and the others tried to throw rocks at the bear, but it seemed useless. The bear kept biting and clawing Summer's legs until they were already bleeding. The cousins had no other choice, so Lorenzo and Kevin grabbed anything they could hit the bear with and threw everything they could find even the toaster they had brought to the backyard. They also made loud noises by screaming and clapping to make sure that the bear won't ever come back again. The bear flinched and was so frightened that it ran away until it was nowhere to be seen. Summer was left there bloodied and wounded. Her cousins rushed her back into their home to administer first aid. Unfortunately, they had to send her to the hospital because of the severity of her injuries. And luckily, she survived even after having her leg almost ripped in two by the vicious black bear. 
Mia and her 14-year-old daughter Lucy decided to go camping in a state park in Idaho. It's Lucy's birthday, and she wishes to experience outdoor camping with her mom. As a good kid and an achiever student, Mia simultaneously grants Lucy's wish and takes her to the state park to camp for three days. Mia has always been an avid fan of the outdoors, and that's why she was delighted to know that her daughter's wish was to experience what outdoor camping feels like. The two hiked their way into the campground upon arriving at the state park. When they finally reached their destination, Mia taught Lucy to build a tent while setting up everything they'll need for the three-day camp. After setting up the tents and the bonfire they'll be lighting up later, the two decided to venture out into the woods, first to explore their surroundings and show Lucy how beautiful and diverse nature is here. While in the woods, the two explored their surroundings and saw many animals. They decided to take pictures and videos as part of their trip when they noticed a strange figure in one of their photos. When Mia had a look at the photo, she realized that there was a grizzly bear just around them. Mia was enthusiastic about having a grizzly bear near them since she loves reading about bears and always wanted to see one up close. However, Lucy was somewhat more scared than amazed that they caught a grizzly bear on camera. She thinks they need to head out to their campground immediately, which Mia understood and it made her decide that they should return to their camp. As soon as they arrived at the camp, Lucy told Mia that she wanted to take a nap and wake up at night so she could better experience what camping feels like without feeling sleepy. Mia agreed and let Lucy first nap at the tent while she went out to the woods again to explore. Mia was convinced that Lucy was alone in the tent as she went deep into the woods to take more pictures and document everything she saw. Everything was going so well not until she heard Lucy scream at the top of her lungs from the camp that it could be heard everywhere. Mia rushed to the camp as soon as she heard Lucy's screams, and as she arrived, she was welcomed by a horrifying sight of a black bear biting her daughter's leg and forcefully dragging her from the inside of the tent. Mia was shocked as she didn't know what to do and told Lucy to calm down as she thought of a way to deter the bear from her daughter. Lucy kept screaming and crying in pain as the black bear kept biting her leg and scratching her to keep her from squirming around. Lucy tried to kick the bear, but it was useless for the bear's enormous size. Meanwhile, Mia tries to stop panicking and think of something to scare the bear off her daughter. After a few seconds, Mia ran to the bear and decided to kick it with her bare legs. The bear growled and grew more aggressive as it scratched Mia's legs with its sharp claws, causing her to scream along with Lucy. However, this didn't stop Mia as she continued screaming, making loud noises and kicking the bear away from her daughter. The bear couldn't stop biting on Lucy's leg, making Mia think of another way. Mia went around the camp searching for a sturdy object to smash the bear with, and as soon as she started looking, she found a huge piece of wood from their bonfire and picked it up. She immediately rushed to the bear and in a second smashed it on the bear's head several times. The bear was so hurt and unable to fight back that it just ran away before receiving another hit from Mia, leaving Lucy severely wounded on the leg. Mia wasted no time and picked Lucy up and they hiked their way back to their car and took her daughter to a nearby hospital, where the doctors told her that she needs to recover for several weeks due to the wound caused by the black bear's bite. After the attack, the officials of the state park searched for the bear so they could euthanize it to better prevent the occurrence of these incidents in the future. Most stories about bears attacking humans are set in the deep wilderness of Alaska or Russia. Still, bears have been known to invade suburbs and houses like raccoons would, mostly because they are driven out of their habitat in search of food, something that trash cans have in abundance. The story we will tell you now is set in Vancouver in 1999, where suburban housewife Kathy Meadows finds herself in the path of a starving black bear searching for food. One afternoon, when Kathy was going about her business tending to her home with her husband at work and her kids at baseball practice, everything was going well, just like any other day. Kathy finished all of her obligations, and the last thing she had to do was take out the garbage, and she could finally relax. 
Bag in hand, she made her way toward the backyard, where she was startled by the sound of metal banging against concrete and a hefty weight pressed against the house's back door. She forced the door open to investigate the sound, only to find that she had just pushed a large black bear out of the way, and it was now looking directly at her, maw drooling and grunting. Kathy screamed as the bear moved towards her. Jamming its head into the door, she frantically tried to close, groaning louder and louder. Of course, Kathy was not going to stop a 250-pound bear from getting through the door, but she recalled that she could not think straight in her adrenaline, and instinct is much stronger than sense in those situations. Eventually, however, she gave up on trying to stop the beast from entering the house and instead let go of the door and ran upstairs to safety. She did that, choosing to run up the stairs and into the main bedroom because it had a deadbolt. Kathy barely closed the door before the bear caught up to her. She shrunk into the corner of the room and stared at the door, expecting the bear to burst in any second. However, the bear never came. Kathy recalled hearing the bear rampaging around her kitchen and living room, but she was too scared to get out and check, and her phone was left downstairs, so she couldn't call for help. All she could do was remain in the corner of the room and wait for her husband to return from work. A few hours later, he returned and knocked on the bedroom door in a panic. When she explained what had happened, he hugged her tightly and told her he was happy she was okay. They made their way downstairs and she was horrified at the damage the bear inflicted on their house. Tables knocked over, walls soiled, couches ripped to shreds, and much more than she could remember. The authorities were called and rangers were dispatched to track the bear. A few days later, Kathy and her husband received a call telling them the bear had to be put down as it was rabid. They were relieved that what happened to Kathy wouldn't happen to anyone else, and they agreed that the damage to the house could be fixed. What was most important was that she was okay. Fourteen-year-old Dominic is a fishing enthusiast. He idolizes his dad, Amir, when it comes to fishing, and he wants to be like him someday. He wishes he could go to a natural river or lake and start fishing, but his dad teaches him all the basics before taking him to an actual river or lake. After teaching Dominic for weeks, Amir grants his child's wish and takes him to Yellowstone Lake. Dominic was happy to finally go fishing with his dad and show off his skills. As they arrived at the lake, Dominic and Amir prepared their small tent first, since they'll be spending the night there. Amir prepares the fishing rods they'll be using while Dominic wanders around the lake and is mesmerized by its beauty. Amir gave Dominic his fishing rod as they began to do their thing, which was fishing. So far, Dominic was doing great catching lake trout, as Amir did. After an hour of fishing, they had a satisfying number of catches, considering that Dominic was just a beginner. After fishing, Amir decided to cook two of their freshly caught lake trout, since he had brought his cooking and grilling materials. This is also his way of celebrating his son's first successful catch. As Amir cooks, Dominic decides to waste time by wandering around the woods just a few feet from where his dad is. Amir constantly reminds Dominic not to wander too far from him, which the kid completely obeys. He likes to walk around and take pictures of anything he can see in his environment. While wandering around, he accidentally stumbled upon a moose carcass, which scared him and made him scream. Hearing his son scream in the woods, Amir rushes to the scene and is surprised to see the moose carcass. Now he understands why his son called. It was indeed horrifying. Amir asked if Dominic was comfortable with what he saw, to which the kid answered, yes. Being curious, Dominic asked questions to his dad about the moose carcass. He grabbed a long stick nearby and poked the animal's dead body as he questioned his dad. Amir patiently answers his son's questions, since the kid wants to learn about how it happened or who or what caused it to be like that. As they were talking to each other, they suddenly heard a rustling sound of footsteps through the woods, which made Dominic drop his stick. And suddenly, out of nowhere, a giant grizzly bear leaps from the tree and lands on Dominic's back, pinning him to the ground. 
Amir was shocked and screamed in terror as he tried to fight the animal by punching and kicking it. The bear began to aggressively scratch Dominic's face and torso with its sharp claws as it bit the kid's head. Dominic tried to fight the animal, but his strength did not match this beast. His body and head started to bleed and hurt significantly from the bear's attacks on him. Meanwhile, Amir keeps fighting the bear, even though the animal shrugs him off by scratching him all over his body. Amir then grabs a thick wooden stick nearby and uses it to hit the grizzly bear, which to his surprise, worked. He continued to hit the grizzly bear with the stick as the bear was bawling and growling at what Amir was doing. After a few hits, punches, and kicks, the bear ran away and grabbed the moose carcass and took it with him. As Amir saw how the bear got away, he assumed that maybe the animal just protected the moose carcass, which was probably his kill. After the attack, Amir carried his bloodied son Dominic to their car and immediately drove off to the nearest hospital he could find. Ignoring his scratches and wounds, he seeks help for his son before the hospital personnel suggest he should get help. He then reported the incident to some Yellowstone officials who decided to search for the bear to euthanize it. Our next story is set in Alaska, the U.S., with one of the highest concentrations of bears in the United States. In 1998, freelance pilot Andrew Kusek flew over the Yukon River transporting goods from Rampart to Huslia on private business. Andrew had been flying for over a decade and was an adept pilot, so this run was just another Monday for him. However, he didn't expect the weather conditions to suddenly worsen considerably, making his standard route between Rampart and Huslia a living nightmare. Within the first third of his journey, approximately 16 miles north of Tanana where the Yukon River and Tanana River meet, Andrew's plane was shaken by sudden wind and turbulence that caused it to spiral out of control and nosedive towards the ground far too fast for comfort. In a panic, Andrew managed to force the plane to correct its course, but only enough for it to get slowed down by the tree line instead of slamming into the ground. Luckily, the drop was not too violent and Andrew survived with a minor concussion and a few bruises. The problem came when he realized there was no way to free his plane from the trees it landed into, let alone get it to fly again. Because of this, his first action upon landing was to release an emergency GPS signal with his location for rescuers to be dispatched. He had always said he would never need it, but it turned into his saving grace. Andrew decided he would climb out of the plane and build a fire so emergency services could see the smoke and he could stay warm at the same time. After the fire was built, there was nothing to do but wait for help to come, so he got some food and curled up by the fire. Moments later, he heard rustling from the trees behind him and saw a giant lumbering shape creeping up on him. His legs went numb as he realized he was about to fall prey to a massive grizzly bear attracted to the smell of his food. The beast looked at him for a moment before breaking into a dead charge. As the distance between them narrowed, Andrew's instinct kicked in and he jumped up and ran to the safety of his wrecked plane. He could hear the thumping of the bear's paws on the ground as it got closer and closer in pursuit, Andrew managed to reach the handle of the plane's door in the nick of time, throwing himself inside just as the bear's claw tore into his pant leg, cutting him from knee to ankle. The animal mass assaulted the door while Andrew watched on, panting and crying from the adrenaline backing to the other side of the plane. His time in the cockpit seemed like days, but his hopes were restored when he heard helicopter blades whirring above the wreckage. Much to his joy, the sound of the helicopter scared the bear away, and it finally retreated into the wilderness, leaving Andrew alone with the rescue workers and paramedics. Andrew was patched up and taken to the nearest hospital so his wounds could be appropriately treated, and his plane was salvaged with his cargo. Today, Andrew still flies his usual routes, but he added a high-caliber rifle to his essential gear. Marley the Grizzly is a bear living in captivity in a conservation center in Canada. 
He was rescued as a young bear, and now that he's celebrating his fifth birthday, the management of the conservation center decided that it was time to release him into the wild. Marley has been a resident of the conservation center ever since he was a young bear. He was found severely wounded, starved, and declawed for unknown reasons, and that's why some officials rescued him and brought him to the conservation center. He was taken care of there by his handler, Harold, who helped raise him for five years. He had become a famous attraction at the conservation center and was often visited by locals and tourists. Everyone, especially the children, loved Marley. He's grown so fond of humans and seems to have already become used to them. And now the management has decided to release Marley from the conservation center since he has grown healthy and fit enough to survive in the wild. With a heavy heart, Harold accepted the management's decision and asked if he could join them when releasing the bear into the wild, which they also agreed to. Harold, along with the other handlers and officials of the conservation center, transported Marley into a boreal forest just within Canada. He was placed in a cage soon to be opened by none other than Harold to finally release him into the wild. As soon as Marley's cage was placed on the ground, Harold stood behind it and decided to open it when he slightly hesitated. He leaned at the cage first and smiles at Marley, knowing they will never see each other again. And with the approval of the officials, Harold finally opened the cage. However, Marley doesn't come out of it. The officials who got into their cars first for safety didn't understand why Marley wouldn't come out of his cage. Since they were behind his cage and it was covered at the back, they couldn't see what Marley was doing. Harold volunteered to go in front of Marley's cage and see why he wasn't coming out. Harold took a few steps first as his legs were shaking from nervousness. He gently peeks at Marley's cage and sets a distance of a few feet away from the bear. Marley was found just sitting quietly inside the cage. Harold faces Marley and gently tells the bear to go outside, which the bear quickly responds to by going out of the cage. Harold expected that Marley was listening to him until Marley suddenly growled and harshly charged at him making him fall to the ground on his back. The officials were shocked as two tranquilizer handlers left the vehicle to rescue Harold. Marley then violently claws Harold's nose off, making Harold scream in pain. Marley then leaves scratches all over Harold's face, torso, and lower body, while the handlers approach the bear to tranquilize it. And within a moment, one of the handlers shot Marley straight in the neck with the tranquilizer, making the bear fall down. The other handler immediately went to the wounded Harold to give him first aid, as he saw severe damage to Harold's nose. Harold was then taken to a hospital where he needed surgery to repair his nose and fully recover from the attack. Andre and his brother Kobe love to drive around Alaska with their family's pickup truck. The two have been driving their family pickup truck anywhere and everywhere they go because they wanted to explore and enjoy their teenage years together. They have several cars at home, but they still use the pickup truck to travel since one would drive while the other sits in the cargo bed and takes in the views. Each time the brothers travel anywhere, one always offers to drive while the other rides shotgun in the back of the truck. One day, the brothers decided to go near a national park and record a video about their trip. Andre decides to be the one driving, while Kobe sits in the cargo bed of the pickup truck, which was his favorite spot of all time. They got inside their vehicle and started to drive off. The brothers were having a lot of fun, especially Kobe, who was in the cargo bed the whole ride. As they passed the national park, they saw a grizzly bear with its two cubs walking at the roadside. Kobe told his brother Andre to stop the vehicle and park it near the grizzlies so they could see them and take close-up photos. Andre was surprised when he leaned back, saw the grizzly bear and his cubs, and then decided to park the vehicle near them. The mother grizzly became startled by the vehicle when it parked near them, as well as the cubs. Kobe was nervous when taking pictures and told Andre to move the car forward so he wouldn't get attacked. Andre insists that Kobe will be fine and refuses to move the vehicle forward. 
The grizzly walks toward the vehicle, which scared Kobe, as he tapped on the vehicle's roof to warn Andre that the animal was approaching him. Andre teases him even more and tells him that he's not going to start the car because the grizzly won't bother to reach for him. Kobe tapped on their vehicle's roof again as the grizzly was now approaching him closer without showing signs of stopping no matter what. Andre decided to start the engine of the vehicle, which relieved Kobe. And as the vehicle slowly moved forward, the grizzly bear got on its feet, stretched its arms out, and reached for Kobe just in time. Kobe fell out of the cargo bed and onto the ground as the grizzly began to attack him by jumping on his body. Clueless about what was happening to his brother, Andre laughs as he thinks he successfully teased his brother and scared him for almost getting reached out to by a bear, only to realize that the vehicle seems lighter. He doesn't hear his brother's voice anymore. When Andre stopped the vehicle and looked back, he saw that Kobe wasn't in the cargo bed anymore. He immediately thought that Kobe had fallen off the cargo bed and was now getting attacked by the grizzly bear. He drove the pickup truck back to where they previously parked and saw that he was right. Kobe was there and was getting attacked brutally by the mother grizzly. The grizzly bear scratches Kobe's weakened body with his sharp claws while biting his head several times. Kobe was crying and screaming in pain as he was trying to defend himself by pushing the grizzly away from him, which unfortunately didn't work. Andre watched in horror as he panicked and tried to think of a way to save his brother until he decided to honk the vehicle's horn to scare the bear away from Kobe. Kobe was surprised since he expected that his brother wouldn't come back for him, but he did. Andre kept honking the vehicle's horn several times as loud as he could as the grizzly became startled by the sound. Andre didn't stop until the grizzly bear ran off with its cubs away from Kobe. When the grizzly bears moved away, Andre immediately got out of the pickup truck and went to Kobe, who was bloodied and severely wounded. He took his brother to a nearby hospital and called their parents to come pick them up. Kobe suffered from severe wounds but was lucky to survive the grizzly bear's brutal attack. Annabelle is a female black bear kept in captivity at a conservation center in Oregon. She's one of the friendliest and gentlest animals at the place, and she was carefully handled by Tessa, her handlers, since she was a cub. Annabelle has been widely visited by people, especially children, as she is very friendly and lively every time she sees some visitors outside of her enclosure. Despite their shy behavior, Annabelle has been fond of people, especially Tessa. Unfortunately, Tessa got sick, making the conservation center change Annabelle's handler while she recovered. Annabelle was frequently unattended during this time, making her aggressive and starving for food. The conservation center thought to neutralize Annabelle at times because she'd been very hostile since Tessa left to recover from her sickness. She allegedly attacked her current handler, which made the conservation center change her handler again. The people loved Annabelle, so the management didn't want to remove her from the conservation center. A few weeks passed and Tessa decided to return to work as she fully recovered from her sickness. The management was relieved to have Tessa as Annabelle's handler as they trusted her to make Annabelle friendly and lively again. On Tessa's first day of getting back to work, everything went well and Annabelle has been feeling better since she returned. However, there was a drastic change in the bear that Tessa didn't know would bring her into danger. One day, Tessa decided to feed Annabelle with acorns for her usual snack. She stood on a high platform above her enclosure and threw the acorns to feed the bear. As Tessa ran out of acorns, she was about to rush outside the enclosure to get more when Annabelle unexpectedly grabbed her leg and dragged her down the chamber, hurting her whole body. The visitors watching them were shocked as the bear kept holding onto her leg while Tessa fought back by kicking her legs. Annabelle grew aggressive as she bit Tessa's leg, making her scream in intense pain. She continued to bite her while clawing her legs and lower body as the visitors asked for help from other handlers and staff at the conservation center. Tessa was screaming Annabelle's name hoping that the black bear that she loved ever since it was a cub would calm down and recognize her. 
but it didn't. Annabelle attacked her even more aggressively, leaving her whole body bloodied and wounded with scratches. A few minutes passed, and the other handlers and staff arrived to neutralize Annabelle and rescue Tessa from her. She was then taken to the hospital to recover as she fell unconscious after the attack. The Conservation Center decided to euthanize Annabelle after the incident. Tessa was heartbroken that the animal had attacked her, for whom she had cared for ever since she was young. She had no choice but to agree to euthanize Annabelle, not just for her safety, but also for the protection of everyone inside the Conservation Center. Still, Annabelle was recognized as one of the most loved animals at the Conservation Center, even after the attack and her death. While driving home from the university, Caesar thinks of a way to entertain himself as he had been driving for hours. As he enters a road in Canada, he sees several bear warning signs and thinks it would be fun to spot bears while on the road. Caesar decided to drive slowly as he thought it would be easier to spot a bear in no time. However, he didn't spot bears, which frustrated him a little. The man kept driving, hoping to spot a bear on the road. After a few minutes of searching and hoping for one to magically appear in front of his vehicle, there were no bears. Caesar just gave up and continued driving until he reached the gasoline station and decided to park his car to buy food at a convenience store. After buying food and beverages at the convenience store, Caesar continued driving until he reached slow traffic. Turns out, there was an accident caused by roadkill that needed to be taken care of, generating the traffic at the moment. Caesar grew impatient as the weather was also going a little too hot, causing him and the other drivers to feel easily irritated with the sudden hot temperature over them. With this, Caesar decided to slightly open his car door to let fresh air enter his car as he rested his head on the headrest and patiently waited for the traffic to get back to normal. As he was resting, Caesar was unaware that he was already falling asleep due to how long the traffic was taking him and the other drivers. Caesar took a nap, not knowing of the danger that is about to happen to him just a few seconds from now. While taking a nap, Caesar was disturbed by a strange force biting through his pants and skin. When the biting began to hurt him, he woke up and saw a black bear biting his leg and forcing itself inside his car. Caesar panicked as the bear growled at him and jumped at him inside his vehicle. The other drivers immediately saw what was happening and were shocked that a black bear was attacking someone inside a car. Meanwhile, Caesar kept screaming and crying out for help as the bear started to claw his face and bite his head. He fought back to try to push the bear away with his own strength. However, it was almost useless as the bear is stronger, appears really hungry, and continues to claw and scratch Caesar's face and head. The other drivers grew concerned about Caesar's situation, and one started honking their horn loudly to scare the bear away. When the bear was disturbed by the noise, other drivers honked their car horns too to scare the bear off Caesar's vehicle completely. When the bear got too startled to continue attacking Caesar, he took this as a chance to push the bear and kick it out of the vehicle several times before closing his car door. Caesar disregarded being wounded for now as the traffic went back to normal and decided to drive himself to a nearby hospital to get help. Meanwhile, the bear was now hunted by officials to euthanize it and prevent further incidents like this in the future. From sheep herders and plane crashes, we now turn our attention to one of the little things in life, fishing. One of the most notable things about Canadian lakes is their fish population and how bountiful the fishing seasons tend to be for newbies and veteran fishermen alike. The subject of this story is newbie fisherman Jim Giles, who set out for Lake Margaret on October 11, 2002 for a relaxed fishing weekend away from the stress of his everyday life. Since Lake Margaret is a popular fishing destination, Jim had no worries about getting lost in the wilderness, as there were usually more fishermen. He got to the lake in the early morning in his truck, stocked with enough provisions to last him for the weekend. After a hearty breakfast and checking his gear, he decided to take a small boat out to the lake and fish from there. 
Paddling was a breeze, and everything seemed like it couldn't get any better. Hours went by as Jim caught a few rainbow trout and relaxed on the lake. Happy with his catch, he decided to head back to his truck to cook up the fish and read a book. As he paddled towards shore, he noticed some movement at the edge of the lake, a few dozen yards from his truck. Upon closer inspection, he saw a tiny brown bear cub lounging around the lake's edge. Jim was always one to appreciate nature and take everything in, but even he knew that seeing a lone bear cub meant the mother was not far behind. With this on his mind, he decided to slow his paddling down to not attract attention, seeing as he was still at least 30 yards from shore. The closer he got, the more he realized that the cub was definitely not alone. Another cub came along, and the mother bear was very close behind. The bear was massive, standing at easily eight feet tall. It was a killing machine like no other. Thoroughly unnerved at this point, Jim tried to get to shore and the safety of his truck as quickly as possible. However, luck was not on his side as the female bear turned towards him and lunged into the water, straight toward his little paddle boat. Bears are notoriously good swimmers, something that Jim would soon see firsthand. In fear, he began to paddle madly towards the shore, which was much closer by this point. Once he could stand in the water, he jumped out of the boat and made a dash for safety. Unfortunately for him, bears are even quicker on land than in water, and it managed to catch up to him and pin him to the ground. Jim instinctively put his hands on the back of his neck as the beast bit at his shoulder and dug its claws into his back. Just when he thought he could either pass out from the pain or die, he heard a thundering boom and felt a wave of relief over him as the bear backed away. A second boom was heard, and the bear grunted, running away toward its cubs. The last thing Jim remembered before he passed out was looking up to see two fishermen carrying rifles running to his aid. He woke up in a hospital in the city with his wife by his side and had a lot of recovering to do. He returned to fish on Lake Margaret two years later, but this time he was in the company of the two fishermen that saved his life and who he could call close friends. Thankfully, Jim never saw a bear again in that area or anywhere else. Hayden is an 18-year-old boy working at his grandfather's ranch in Wyoming. Since he's on a school vacation, he spends all his free days here working at the farm along with his grandfather's dog, Pluto. When Hayden takes Pluto's leash off, the dog tends to bark at someone or something near the woods. Hayden would always assume that Pluto was fighting a raccoon or barking at a wild animal, so he decided not to pay attention every time this happened. Weeks have passed, and Hayden could only notice that Pluto's barking has become mysteriously frequent, and every time he has his leash off, the dog will either bark or hesitate to come near the woods. With this, Hayden started to get curious about what creature had been bothering the dog for days. One day, Hayden decided to accompany Pluto to the woods with his leash on. At first, Pluto was too hesitant to come with Hayden to the woods, but when he realized that his owner was accompanying him, he relaxed and followed him obediently. Surprisingly, this time, Pluto didn't bark at anyone or anything. Their walk in the woods went smoothly, and they made it back to the ranch without Pluto barking at whoever or whatever he saw in the woods before. With that, Hayden concluded that maybe the dog was barking at even small animals or just plain nothing. The next day, Hayden removed Pluto's leash again, since the dog wasn't barking at anyone or anything anymore. He went on to do some remaining work at the ranch when he heard Pluto barking at something again. Hayden didn't hesitate this time and now paid attention to what the dog was doing. When he arrived at Pluto's location, he was surprised to see a grizzly bear with two cubs behind it. Pluto was furiously barking at the bear as the giant animal was growling and prompting to attack the dog at any moment. Hayden grew worried as he immediately tried to grab Pluto to take him away, but instead got tackled down by the bear in a split second to the ground, which caused the dog to get scared and run away to the ranch. 
The bear got on top of Hayden's back as the boy covered his nape with his bare hands to protect it. The grizzly growled and clawed his back, making him scream loudly. Hayden tried his best to squirm in his place and get away from the bear's grip, but the grizzly was just too heavy and he couldn't even budge. When the grizzly pulled away for a second, Hayden took this opportunity to use his strength to stand up and push the bear away before running to the ranch. Surprisingly, the bear decided to chase him, which terrified him even more. As soon as he reached the ranch, Hayden grabbed a shovel from the ground and smashed it into the bear's head. The bear flinched and tried to grab Hayden again, but the boy broke the shovel onto its head again, which caused the animal to run back into the woods. After the attack, Hayden decided to bring Pluto and drive himself a few miles from the ranch to the hospital to treat his badly wounded back. When his parents knew of this, they decided to hire a much bigger and stronger person to work at the ranch while Hayden recovered from the bear attack that had happened to him there. Gemma is a famous YouTube personality known for her paranormal adventures and scary supernatural encounters. She goes to haunted, abandoned, or spooky places to discover whether supernatural beings are real and prove them with footage. For her newest scary adventure, she decides to feature the Appalachian Mountains and its never-ending saga of folklore and legends. Her recent goal was common, to find out whether Bigfoot is real. She arrived at the Appalachian Mountains with other explorers Paxton and Gracie, who will accompany her for a three-day trip to prove that Bigfoot exists. After hiking for hours, the three arrived at an abandoned cabin in the woods and decided they should stay there for the rest of their trip. It's also an excellent place to camp since it's in the middle of the forest and it's even more possible to spot a potential supernatural being in a spot like that. On the first day of their trip, Gemma, Paxton, and Gracie explored the woods in daylight while recording all their exploration on the footage. So far, there were no signs of any strange supernatural beings. After hours and hours of exploring, they returned to their cabin at night and decided to end their video. The three have discussed whether they should go at night in hopes of finding more evidence or save all their plans for tomorrow. Gemma decided they should all get some rest as they would be exploring tomorrow at both daylight and night for tomorrow's footage to gather more evidence and explore the woods even further. After the discussion, the three of them drifted off to sleep. Paxton and Gracie immediately fell asleep while Gemma was bothered by the sound of the cabin door creaking open. The cabin door is slightly faulty and opens even with a bit of wind blowing against it and it makes a sound when it creaks open. That's why Gemma couldn't fall asleep as the door was getting loud. Suddenly, heavy footsteps could be felt against the cabin's wooden floor. Paxton and Gracie were still asleep while Gemma stood up to find out what it was. Since there's only an emergency light providing light in their cabin, Gemma had a hard time recognizing who or what this creature is. The footsteps became heavier, indicating that it was fast approaching. Gemma tiptoed to her bag to grab her camera to try and record everything. She believes that this creature is Bigfoot, given that its footsteps are heavy and its figure is enormous. As Gemma was recording on her camera, she found it hard to determine what type of creature it was, especially that it's black and was breathing heavily. Gemma wants the animal to show itself, so she thinks of a way to disturb it. Gemma shouts at the creature, waking up Paxton and Gracie. Gemma signaled the two that they shouldn't make any other movements since there was a creature inside the cabin that she couldn't identify. The two remained seated on the floor as Gemma shouted at the beast again. The creature stopped walking for a moment, staring directly at Gemma in the dark. Gemma shouted again, but the beast charged at her and tackled her down to the wooden floor, inducing panic in Paxton and Gracie. As Gemma looked at the creature, it was not Bigfoot, but a giant black bear, unusually massive. Gemma screams at Paxton and Gracie that it's a black bear, which terrifies them. The bear started to claw Gemma's face, arms, torso, and lower body as she struggled to get out of its grip. Paxton and Gracie tried to throw their bags at the bear, but they got clawed and scratched by the aggressive animal. The black bear continued to attack Gemma, and Gemma's camera fell to the floor and was nowhere to be seen now. 
Paxton and Gracie began shouting at the bear, making other loud noises by stomping on the wooden floor to scare the bear away. The bear growled loudly as it tried to bite Gemma's arm, causing her to scream. Paxton tried to smash things on the bear's head, but always got scratched until Gracie grabs a flare gun from her bag. Without hesitation, Gracie fired the flare gun at the cabin's chimney, which made the bear flinch. She stomped on the floor to scare the bear even more until it decided to run away back into the woods. Gemma was left severely wounded and unconscious. Even though it was late at night, Paxton and Gracie decided to hike back to their vehicle to take Gemma to the nearest hospital. Gemma survived the attack, but had to stay for a long time in the hospital to recover. She decided to close her channel in the meantime, as she will not be doing any videos until she's fully healed. Today is Catherine's training for her archery competition. However, there is a twist. She had to hunt a real elk to test her skills with the help of her father, Lawson, a licensed archery hunter. Catherine and Lawson decided to head to a national forest in Montana to hunt for elk. Catherine is nervous about hunting elk, but her dad convinces her to do it as he will be helping her all along the way. As the two arrived at the national forest, they prepared their bows and arrows for hunting. Catherine was still nervous, but Lawson tried to cheer his daughter up and do well with their archery hunting today. Catherine and Lawson walk into the forest as he teaches her more about archery hunting and how to improve her aim and focus while targeting an object. Catherine listens to her father carefully, slowly forgetting about being nervous about her first elk hunt. When an elk passed by in front of them, Lawson sees this as a perfect opportunity to show his skills to his daughter. He began aiming his bow at the elk and waited for it to stay still before shooting it with his arrow. The elk began to stay still for a few seconds, making it an easy target for Lawson. He didn't waste time as he aimed his bow and quickly shot the arrow at the elk which struck its abdomen perfectly. Catherine was amazed at her dad's archery skills. When Lawson approached her and told her that she didn't have to hunt a real elk, aside from the fact that she wasn't licensed yet, but instead tested her skills by making the elk carcass her target, Catherine heaved a sigh of relief as she started to aim her bow at the dead elk for practice. As Catherine was about to shoot the arrow from her bow, a giant grizzly bear appeared from the woods and attempted to eat the elk carcass out of hunger. Lawson screamed to scare the bear away, but instead it charged at Catherine and tackled her to the ground. Catherine was surprised and terrified at the same time as the bear started to claw her arms and legs. On the other hand, Lawson was also terrified as the bear aggressively attacked his daughter. He was screaming and crying in panic, as Catherine did too. Catherine's bow and arrow were also on the ground a few feet away as she tried to reach for an arrow to stab the bear. However, the bear kept putting its weight on her body as it attacked her with its claws, so Catherine couldn't take it and give up. Lawson finally regained his composure as he tried his best not to panic and aimed his bow and arrow straight into the bear's heart. His hands were shaking due to the panic he's been feeling, but this was the only way he knew to scare the bear away and save his daughter. He didn't waste any more time as he shot the arrow and struck the bear's heart in no time. Lawson pulled out another arrow and shot it into the bear's arm before it fell motionless. Lawson immediately picked wounded Catherine up from the ground as they rushed to their vehicle to take her to a hospital. Catherine's bow and arrow used for the competition were left behind in the forest. Still, it doesn't matter to Lawson now as long as she gets taken to a hospital for immediate medical attention. The Canadian Rockies are one of the best locations worldwide for sightseeing and observing wildlife, as the Canadian wilderness is vast and breathtaking. Tourists come from around the world to camp in the Rockies and maybe see some small animals, hike, fish, and much more. However, the Rockies are not only home to harmless critters and fish. The Rockies are home to brown and black bears, massive territorial animals that will not hesitate to attack if provoked. The worst of these situations occurred to Allison Michaels. 
This 36-year-old counselor decided a fun family trip to the Rockies would be perfect for bonding and relaxing in nature. Allison, her husband James, and their son Daniel arrived at Red Earth Creek in September of 1999, thoroughly equipped for hiking, fishing, and most importantly, camping. Their tour guide told them they would take a bus to some of the popular camping sites, approximately 50 miles from Red Earth Creek, after which they would be free to do what they wanted. Much to their son's dismay, they were taught primary defense against bears and other animals, and each of them got their can of bear spray, although they were assured that bears are scarce in those parts. After their camp was set up, Allison decided she wanted to walk to unwind after the long bus ride. The tour guide praised the beauty of the nearby lakes, so she set out for the 30-minute walk and left her husband and son to their antics. Although it was freezing, the natural beauty of the Rockies made Allison's walk pass much quicker, and before she knew it, she was already at the lake. Having been satisfied by the lake, she decided it was about time to head back to the camp. On her way back, she had the strange feeling of being watched and she noticed that the trail looked much different than when she was going to the lake. Moving through the fresh snow, she realized she had taken the wrong route, and something was moving in front of her. As she got closer, she realized it was a massive grizzly bear, so she avoided it in a wide arc back to where she remembered the other trail. However, as she got a better angle at the bear, she noticed it wasn't alone. With it, two cubs were eating a deer. This was a mother bear and they are one of the most dangerous animals you can meet in the wild. Much to Allison's horror, the bear noticed and stared her down as she moved away. She prayed that the bear would leave her be. But before she knew it, it was already charging at her. Her cold fingers fumbled with her small can of bear spray, but she managed to release the safety and spray the bear in the face right before it got to her. The bear staggered back and she used her only opportunity to sprint in the other direction. The bear quickly recovered and was on her tail. Allison is alive today because she caught a glimpse of a truck in the woods. In desperation, she raced to the truck and rejoiced as she found the unlocked doors. The bear attempted to breach the doors but was unable to, eventually giving up and returning to its cubs. In some Canadian provinces, People leave their car doors unlocked in case of bear attacks, and Allison was massively thankful for the friendly nature of Canadians. The Gatlinburg Bypass in Tennessee is now more known for having many black bear sightings and encounters over time. However, drivers must be more careful when passing by the road after a black bear gets hit by a car, especially if black bears are trying to cross it. Dallas is an 18-year-old boy who is still improving his driving skills. Every time he goes out to drive, he always makes sure to pass by the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and along Gatlinburg Bypass. He loves black bears, and he always passes by in hopes of finding one. Even though it's highly prohibited to feed black bears and other wild animals, Dallas loves black bears so much that he secretly leaves food on the roadside for black bears to find and eat. After leaving some food, Dallas immediately heads out to drive away so the bears won't see him and associate him with food. As time passes, black bears are becoming more visible on the roadside, specifically looking for food. Dallas still goes by to give them food whenever they're not around and drives away right after, so he can't be seen. One day, Dallas decided to pass by Gatlinburg Bypass as usual to give food to the black bears. He pulled over on the side of the road got out and took out a bag of acorns and some meat. However, he couldn't find the right time to place the food near the woods, since many people were passing by the road now. So he just got inside his car first and left the door open, just in case traffic slowed down a bit. Dallas waited a long time, but the traffic was still the same. Eventually, he fell asleep sitting in his car seat for a while. A couple of minutes passed and Dallas was still sleeping, until he felt something move in front of him. Then he woke up, and he was surprised to see a black bear in front of him, staring blankly at his face. Dallas was shocked and delighted at the same time to see a black bear in front of him. Slowly, Dallas got out of the car as the bear took a few steps away from him. When he thought the bear would not be hostile against him, 
he took out the bag of nuts and acorns and threw some in front of the bear. And as expected, the bear ate it without hesitation. Dallas turned to see if any cars were passing by and was glad that the heavy traffic a while ago was gone and there were fewer vehicles now. He continued to feed the bear until all the food was gone, but something was wrong. Dallas thought the bear would walk away from him after being fed, but the bear slowly approached him instead. He tried to shoo the bear away, but it wouldn't work. When he was about to run into his car, the bear charged at him and took him down to the ground, growling and attacking him for food. Dallas cried for help as the black bear slashed his face with its claws, causing his face to bleed instantly. He tried to shake his body, but the bear easily overpowered him. The bear started biting and clawing his legs violently. He's now crying in excruciating pain and only hoping for a concerned driver to stop and save him. As he was about to close his eyes and give up, he heard several people screaming, making loud noises and honking their car horns to scare the bear away. When Dallas opened his eyes, a police officer got out of his vehicle and fired his gun beside the bear, which scared the animal instantly and made it run to the woods. Due to the severity of his injuries, Dallas was sent to the hospital after the incident and received extensive care. Circuses are grand festivities where the whole family can come out and have an excellent time watching the various performers do tricks. Still, one of the things about circuses is that they are notorious for mistreating animals. Our next story is set in Romania and concerns itself with Danut, a performing grizzly bear, and his trainer in the traveling circus passing through Brasov, Romania. Danut was a veteran of the circus scene and he was most famous for his act of bursting watermelons and wrestling with the circus strongman. The bear was one of the main attractions of the circus, although it was not as popular in Romania then. On August 5, 1996, the circus was passing through Brasov, Romania, spreading the word of itself around the city. So there was bound to be a large number of people rushing to see the spectacle. On the opening night, the crew performed their routine as they had done a thousand times before, with Danut emerging from his designated area around the middle of the performance. The crowd gave him an enthusiastic welcome in the form of clapping and screaming, and the bear's trainer urged it to walk around the perimeter of the stage so people could pet him, as they usually did. Everything was as expected, and they continued for the rest of the performance, the news performances lasted around 15 minutes, so he would not get too stressed. But for this performance, his trainer wanted him to go beyond that and shoot for 30 minutes. They had never done this before, but the newt seemed okay, so they continued. The crowd absolutely loved the big grizzly, so they did not notice the signs of anxiety in the heat of the moment. The end of Danut's performance was accompanied by a standing ovation, and his trainer took him around the perimeter once more to wish everyone goodbye. The woman, who preferred to remain anonymous, was the last to touch Danut, but her goodbye was cut short by the stressed bear clamping its jaws onto her arm and pulling her onto the stage area. Screams and chaos erupted from the crowd as some people ran away from the scene, while others looked on in horror. Danute's trainer immediately pulled on his chain and collar, but this was a grizzly bear, and a single man would not move him an inch. The victim screamed as Danute gnawed on her arm, and the trainer looked on helplessly. It wasn't until a few minutes later when a tranquilizer dart struck Danute in the neck that the situation finally calmed down. He slumped over after a few seconds, with the woman's arm still in his mouth. By this time, emergency services were dispatched to the circus, and the woman was taken into care. Although circus performances featuring animals can be pretty entertaining, this story reminds us that wild animals will always be rough, and you can never trust them completely. Unfortunately, because of this outburst, Danut had to be put down, and the circus was banned from using animals in any and all performances from that year on. Danut's trainer was barred from the circus for ignoring the bear's warning signs and irresponsible behavior. The woman that Danut attacked survived, 
but lost all use of her arm below the elbow. In November of 2003, on the south coast of the United States, hobbyist hunter Philip Montagna found himself in the most terrifying situation of his life. The massive forests of Kodiak Island would become the site of terror and brutality for the young hunter who came face to face with a giant Kodiak bear. In the early morning of that fateful day, Philip and some friends decided to head out into the wilderness south of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge to hunt Sitka deer. It was the peak of the hunting season when the deer would be plentiful and relatively easy to hunt down. Philip and his friends set up camp in a remote part of the refuge, isolated from other hunters for miles. The group decided to start at 6 a.m. in groups of two. There were six of them, and Philip partnered up with his longtime hunting friend, Gene. Approximately two hours and six miles later, the pair found the perfect nesting place to wait for any deer coming their way. The conditions were ideal. They were downwind from the deer, camouflaged and completely hidden. Although waiting is tedious when you're trying to hunt, the pair stayed deadly silent while expecting the deer to arrive. After hours, a small group of Sitka deer finally showed up a few hundred yards from their nest. They waited with bated breath for them to move closer so they could get a clear shot, but they were not the only stalkers there. In the distance, Jean spotted a dark shape making its way through the forest, progressively getting larger and faster. The blood in their veins turned to ice as they realized that a massive Kodiak bear was coming straight for them. Armed with their guns and regulation bear spray, they watched, frozen in fear, as the bear came barreling out of the underbrush, mauling an unsuspecting deer, killing it instantly. Having never seen such a beast, Philip thought the best course of action would be to slowly back away and pray that the bear was happy with the deer and wouldn't set its sights on them. They did that, backing away into the tree line, back into the direction they came from. Just when they thought they were safe, they heard thumping and grunting as they saw the behemoth running toward them. Philip was the first to be knocked over, and he instinctively curled into the fetal position, protecting his neck and insides. He noted that he never felt anything as strong as that bear. The beast tossed him around with no effort and stomped on him, seemingly playing with his food. It did the same with Jean, leaving both of them wondering when their final moments would come. It stopped just as Philip felt the beast's hot breath on his neck. They learned that playing dead in situations like these would make the bear lose interest, which is precisely what happened. It slowly backed off and went back to its previous kill. Gene and Philip did not dare move for over 30 minutes, just in case the bear would come back. However, it never did come back, and the pair was left with several broken bones and cuts from the bear's claws. They never split into groups after that. Reed is an adult driving his car around Wyoming when he spotted a convenience store beside a gas station on a highway. He thought he could use some of his time to park his vehicle and rest before driving around again. He parked his car on the far side of the gas station since the parking spaces in front of the convenience store were already occupied. After he parked his vehicle, Reed immediately went inside the convenience store to buy himself some food and drinks. After buying some food and drinks, Reed sat in front of a table inside the convenience store to eat. He could already feel tired and frustrated from all his driving since he'd been driving for hours when he passed by Wyoming. While eating peacefully, Reed noticed a strange black figure standing beside his car from a distance. He thought he just saw things, so he didn't mind it at first. When he finished his food, he decided to leave the convenience store immediately and head back to his car to rest some more. As soon as he got back, he was surprised to see a black bear trying to open the car door of the shotgun seat. Reed froze in his place, as he didn't know what to do, until he removed his shoe and threw it at the bear to make it back away. As he threw a shoe, he didn't expect what would happen next. Instead of backing away, the bear was intimidated and growled as it immediately charged in Reed's direction. Reed felt his pockets quickly for his car keys as he sprinted to get inside his car just before the bear could get him. He ran for the car seat in time, but the black bear grabbed him by the leg before he could close the car door. 
Reed was being forcefully dragged outside by the bear as he repeatedly squirmed and kicked the bear's face. After a few seconds, he kicked as hard as possible, making the bear release his leg and let him go before running away. Reed made it back into the car again and drove away with his leg still wounded to find help. He hasn't gotten his shoe back after it was thrown at the bear. Still, he nevertheless is grateful to have survived the incident without suffering significant injuries from the ferocious beast. The bear species are not exclusive to polar bears, grizzly bears, or black bears. There are still lesser known types of bears that are yet to be paid attention to and noticed. One of these bears is the sloth bear, a specific bear species native to the forests and woodlands of India, southern Nepal, and Sri Lanka. They weigh no more than 500 pounds and are smaller than other species of bears but they are considered one of the most dangerous animals in the wild and one of the deadliest animals in India. Although their diet consists of termites and ants, they are still responsible for several bear attack incidents, especially in India. One particular and unusual sloth bear to date is the sloth bear of Mysore, which is a sloth bear that is infamously known to have killed 12 people and injured 30 more in 1957. In today's video, you're about to witness the most bone-chilling and terrifying encounter of a woman with a sloth bear that almost ripped her face off. An 84-year-old woman in India named Lalita Patel decided to share her story about her encounter with the infamous sloth bear of Mysore and how the bear almost took her life by attempting to rip her face off. The then 19-year-old Lalita decided to spend her vacation in Mysore, her hometown. The Mysore state back then was full of forests, trees, woodlands, and diverse environments. Lalita decided to stay at her aunt's house in Nagvara Hills, a place 100 miles away from Bangalore. As soon as Lalita got to her aunt's house, her cousins were happy to see her and greeted her with open arms. The warm greetings she got from her relatives touched Lalita, which is why she had already started getting drawn to the place. Aside from being around nature and various environments, it can also help Lalita ease her stress and be happy once in a while. When afternoon came, Lalita was approached by two of her cousins, who were also 19-year-olds, named Emir and Prima. Lalita was asked questions by the two, and the three of them quickly got along with each other. While they were talking, Emir mentioned an infamous sloth bear lurking in the woodlands of Nagvara Hills and is currently terrorizing the people in their area. This was the first time Lalita heard about a sloth bear, so she quickly became curious and eager to hear more about it. Despite what Emir had been telling her, she was fascinated by sloth bears rather than terrified of them. Prima added that the sloth bear had already killed six people and injured countless working within the woodlands to hunt for food or animals. These details about this infamous sloth bear have made Lalita even more curious. Lalita asked Amir and Prima if they could take her to where the sloth bear lived, but they refused. They told Lalita that it was best for her to stay inside and be safe, as the bear's reign of terror was still there in their area. However, Lalita was very curious and just wanted to know where the sloth bear lived or what they looked like. Ymir and Prima had no choice but to take her outside to feed her curiosity. When they were already outside, the three immediately headed to the woods to point out where the sloth bear lived to Lalita. After a few minutes of walking in the woods, they arrived at a meadow and were greeted by the cold breeze. Mir and Prima stated that the area was the site of the majority of the sloth bear assaults and the deaths of all eight victims. Lalita was intrigued by the unusual bear's appearance, even though she feared its potential for violence. The three decided to return home right away as they were finished. They were aware that the sloth bear was nearby and might ambush them and harm at least one of them. While walking in the woods, Prima heard footsteps beside Emir's path. The three decided to stop for a minute to observe what was causing the footsteps and what they should do about it. When they realized the footsteps were getting closer and faster, they decided to run as fast as they could. While they were running, the footsteps also became fast, causing the three to get anxious and run away faster than they have ever run. As soon as they got out of the woods, they immediately headed home and decided not to tell their older relatives so they wouldn't be temporarily restrained from going outside. 
After the encounter, Lalita was sleepless and had been thinking of what was chasing her and her two cousins that day. As the days passed, the number of people that the sloth bear had unfortunately killed went from six to nine in just days. The next day, Lalita asked Amir and Prima if they could accompany her to the woods to see the sloth bear. Amir told Lalita that she was crazy for trying to get a glimpse of the deadly creature, but Lalita insisted that she was just curious and that she won't do anything stupid. She also assured Amir and Prima that she was fine and it was okay if she would see just the creature's face. Amir and Prima were convinced and agreed to let Lalita venture into the woods again with them. This time, Emir brought a torch while Prima brought a makeshift wooden spear to protect themselves in case the aggressive sloth bear might come and attack them. As they reached the meadow they visited before, the three saw the sloth bear resting at a distance, staring at them. Lolita was amazed by its appearance. It didn't seem as big as the other bear species. Lolita was fascinated and satisfied that she had already seen a sloth bear. With Lolita's excitement about the sloth bear comes Emir and Prima becoming agitated over the fact that this might be the sloth bear of Mysore that is responsible for numerous deaths and injuries of the people around their area. Emir held on tightly to his torch and made sure that the wind wouldn't blow the fire so they could have something to defend themselves in case they were the next ones to be targeted by the infamous bear. After a few minutes, the trio decided to head back as Prima didn't feel good about what they were doing. They moved cautiously as they left the meadow to avoid the bear's attention. The three heaved a sigh of relief as soon as they got out. While they were walking outside, they were surprised not to hear those weird footsteps that they heard. Lolita showed that she was also glad that the footsteps were gone, but deep down, she was terrified of what would happen next. They thought everything was peaceful until suddenly a sloth bear jumped out of the bush and directly tackled Lolita to the ground before dragging her into the meadow. Emir and Prima became terrified as they were also shocked about what happened, but they knew they must save their cousin. Lolita screamed and cried as the sloth bear dragged her by the legs. She tried her best to squirm and move around, but the bear wasn't planning on letting her go that easily. Emir and Prima followed the bear and Lalita until they reached the meadow, where Lalita was tackled on the ground by the sloth bear, who got on top to mutilate her face. Indeed, this is the sloth bear of Mysore, responsible for nine deaths and countless injuries. The sloth bear began to slash Lalita's body with its long clawed paws and even attempted to bite her arm. Lalita was screaming in excruciating pain as Emir and Prima were almost clueless about what to do to help Lalita. After thinking of a way, Emir decided that they should ward off the bear with their weapons and try to look scary, even just for once. As they discussed what they were about to do with the bear, Lalita was now screaming in pain as the sloth bear slashed her face twice. Blood was already dripping from Lalita's body as Emir and Prima bravely walked over to the gruesome scenario and tried to scare the sloth bear off Lalita. Emir waved his torch in front of the sloth bear, while Prima aimed the spear's tip at the bear in case it attacked them. After a few tries, they successfully scared off the sloth bear, but Lolita was left there bloody and unconscious. Emir and Prima immediately took Lolita back home to get treatment for her wounds. She was then taken to a hospital to get immediate treatment. After the attack, the sloth bear of Mysore killed three more victims, making it twelve. Because of this concerning number, an Indian writer and hunter named Kenneth Anderson decided to venture into Mysore to conduct an expedition to end the killing saga of the infamous sloth bear. The trip was successful as Anderson shot the sloth bear before succumbing to death. After killing the sloth bear, everyone's lives returned to normal, and they were glad to be living everyday lives again. It was a cold day like any other day at the North Pole when Mark saw the white polar bear before him. It was staring right at him as if taken by surprise with his presence, and Mark was oblivious on what to do. His heart was pounding so loud that he thought it could jump out of his chest at any moment. His eyes were wide and he felt frozen in place, unable to move. The bear started walking towards him slowly almost cautiously, as though it would scare him away. He stayed rooted where he stood for some time, too scared to even take a step backwards. 
Finally, as the bear got closer, it let out a low rumble and tilted its head. The noise sent shivers down Mark's spine, and the adrenaline rushed through him. He turned around and bolted away as quickly as possible, his heart still thundering inside his chest. The bear charged after Mark, and he heard the growl right behind his back. He was running for his dear life, hoping to God that he would find a way to escape this. Soon, he felt the bear swipe and tear his clothes, barely missing his flesh, and he fell to the ground and briskly released his bag from his back, which he used as a line of defense between him and the bear. As the bear growled, he used that time to get out a can of bear spray, and he readied it. Mark looked over his shoulder and saw the bear standing just a few feet away, glaring at him. He aimed at the animal, but didn't spray the contents of the can yet. He was waiting for it to come close enough before he unleashed the can's furious content. The bear began charging again, and Mark knew he couldn't outrun it. He waited with his finger shaky on the trigger. Mark squeezed the trigger and sprayed a large amount of foam in front of him, aiming it directly at the bear. Then he waited for a reaction. He heard a yelp and looked up just in time to see the bear stumble backward a bit, surprised that it didn't get sprayed. Mark waited anxiously for the creature to charge back at him, but it remained on the side of the clearing, seemingly confused by the sudden attack from the raging spray can. This gave Mark time to catch his breath. The bear stood there with furrowed brows until the last drops of the spray had faded away. After a while, the animal turned around and walked away, leaving behind nothing but empty woods as he left. Mark took a deep breath of relief and exhaled slowly. He sat there for a moment, taking in all that had happened since they arrived here that day. Gary had a close bear encounter that almost claimed his life up in the North Pole. Gary was unsure exactly how long he'd been out there, but it felt like forever, trapped with nothing but the cold to keep him company as he waited for rescue. He was certain that by now, they would have noticed his absence and would send search parties to retrieve what part of him remained. Thankfully, he was still whole. He had been one of those who had gone out to explore in groups, but he had taken a detour, telling everyone that he was right on their trail as he needed to examine the ice and take notes for his research. It was then he'd lost track of time, and then the snow had come to cover up their trail. The cold made him think about his mortality, but it was nothing like the growl of a bear behind him, which made him forget the cold in an instant that he stopped shivering as his eyes widened with horror. Gary spun around to face the creature. It was large enough to easily crush him in its jaws, and it was staring directly at him from only a few feet away. The sight alone made him freeze in fear. His legs buckled beneath him. He couldn't even scream as he fell to the ground. He tried desperately to roll into some place out of the way as he stared up at this massive beast's snout. He couldn't stop shaking. As it sniffed and came closer, Gary began to tremble. Then he heard voices shouting orders nearby. There were shouts and footsteps approaching quickly, but no one else seemed to be here, so he assumed they hadn't noticed him yet. He held his breath as he prepared himself for what would happen next, which he wasn't sure if it was the bear killing him or the men finding him right before the bear attacked him or, most probably, when it was about to kill him. Gary heard whispers and crunching footsteps behind him, and he saw the bear look at both sides of him as if something else had its attention. Don't try to move, an unfamiliar voice said. Even Gary's legs wouldn't let him, so that was highly unlikely. He knew fear to come in different ways. It sucked that his had decided to seize him and freeze his legs to the spot when he was supposed to be running toward the voices. Just when Gary was about to confirm whether they were with guns, he heard the cocking of various rifles behind him, and for once, he felt safe. He could move his legs, and this time, he took a step back, and just then, several shots rang in the air, scaring the bear and causing it to turn and run. 
Gary sighed and sighed. He was glad to be alive. He watched the bear become smaller and smaller till it was out of sight. Today's story takes us to Red Lake, Ontario, where a man who had gone camping met a fate which no one should have to endure. Capable of lifting over 500 kilograms and with a bite force strong enough to crush a bowling ball, the grizzly bear is one of the most feared bears across America, Canada, and Alaska. They are extremely ferocious, territorial, and exceedingly dangerous when agitated. With 11 people killed every year by this creature, the odds might seem extremely low, but the chances are you wouldn't be prepared to deal with their hostility when it comes running straight at you. Jonathan Myers was an avid outdoorsman. As a boy, he had loved camping, going out with his father during the weekends, and spending time in the great outdoors, getting used to living life in the wilderness. As he got older, he decided to do it more and even became a guide for one of the cabin houses around Red Lake. He took hikers and campers through the trails and often would show them bears and deer and other wild creatures which called the great wilderness their home. Jonathan was great at his job and more than anything, he absolutely enjoyed it. He understood the risk involved with living out there, and he explained this to the younger campers who would decide to bed down for the night. Jonathan knew that nature was only as friendly as the guy you walked by on the street. At the slightest occurrence, everything could change, and one had to be prepared for that. He was always prepared. In his Jeep, he carried a tranquilizer rifle which he could use for bigger targets knowing that there were bears and pumas lurking around. He also had hooks for snakes and nets to hold down badgers. Jonathan had worked with the park for the last five years without any incident. All his campers had returned fine, and the same with the hikers as well. With such stellar performance, Jonathan usually had a lot of free time on his hands and used it to map out the place, exploring past the known and available regions of the wilderness, trying to see how far he could go and then navigate his way back to the campsite. Sometimes he would hike too far out and would have to make camp himself before turning back the next day. Doing this multiple times was no problem at all. He was always well equipped had a satellite phone with him so he could easily call out if there was any trouble or could be reached as well. As a professional, Jonathan always made plans for everything, but it was one of these hikes that would prove to be near fatal. It will show that even the most experienced of men would lose in a direct battle with Mother Nature. Jonathan knew this, and despite his best attempt, there was only so much he could do against the force of the earth. Taking his truck, Jonathan drove all the way out to the edge of the campground and began hiking his way down to the Chikuni River. He followed it, heading down to where he had left his last marker. He was hoping he would be able to get further down and do some sightseeing before he would turn back the next day. As he continued down the river, he looked across with his binoculars and saw them for the first time three bears, a mama, and two smaller cubs. They were on the other side of the river, munching on some fish which the mother had snatched from the river. Jonathan took out his camera and took a photo and recorded a video on his phone, trying to get the best shot he could. Afterwards, he continued heading down until he came to the tree where he had tied a piece of cloth to remind himself of how far he had gotten. He pulled it loose and stuffed it in his bag before continuing into uncharted territory. He took in the scenic view, taking photos as he went along, reveling in how peaceful it was out there. By four, he stopped and began setting up shelter, using the small deployable tent which he had carried in his bag. Once he set up, he held it down with rocks and covered it in dried grass and twigs before heading back to the side of the river. Using a stick and line of twine, he was able to catch some small fish. He took his quarry further downstream before he built a small fire to cook the fish. He knew the smell would attract animals to his location, 
So he made sure that he cooked all of it at once and ate it right there. The rest of it was stored in a tightly sealed flask, which he took with him and headed back to the spot where he'd set up the tent. Once in, he decided to retire for the night. Six hours into the night, Jonathan heard pawing on his tent. Listening intently, he realized that there was something outside. He stayed still, hoping that the creature would simply go away after it had fulfilled its curiosity. He could not see it through the walls of the tent, but the force of the creature had told him exactly what it was. Thirty minutes later, there was silence, and the creature seemed to be retreating. Jonathan knew that he had not agitated it, and had only wanted to know what the tent was. Once he was certain that the creature was gone, he sat up and ran his hands along the sides of the tent, making sure that it had not been ripped through by the sharp claws of the creature. He found a few slashes on the side, but they weren't enough to affect the integrity of the tent. A low growling sound from the side of the tent reached his ears, and he realized that the bear was not alone. The mother bear he had seen across the river had come all the way down there, and it was not happy with whatever his tent was. Its jaws clamped down on one of the support beams of the tent and began pulling it. Jonathan held on for dear life inside the small tent as it pulled him. He tried reaching for the rifle, but it was dark, and the force with which he was being pulled caused things to go tumbling around in the tent. Suddenly, the wall of the tent ripped free from where the bear had slashed through it, and Jonathan fell right through. He realized that he was outside and instantly took off running, but he was unable to get far in the darkness as he tripped over a branch and fell face first onto the ground. Jonathan took a breath and put both his hands over the back of his head and spread his legs, trying to regulate his breathing. He knew that if he played dead, the creature would most likely let it be. He heard the three bears rushing toward him, their paws pounding against the mulched earth. The creatures reached him and instantly began clawing at his back. Jonathan groaned in pain, doing his best to stay still as they continued their assault on him. Their claws slashed through his shoulder blades, and the younger cubs tore bits of flesh off him. Jonathan held out as long as he could, taking the pain through tears. Eventually, he passed out from the pain. The next morning, the bears were gone, and Jonathan was alive. However, he was unable to move and was in severe pain, with his entire back covered in bites and cuts. Luckily, he was found by hikers from another camp later that evening and was quickly taken by helicopter to a nearby hospital. By some miracle, Jonathan survived, despite losing a lot of blood. For several months, he was completely unable to use his right arm. However, he was able to make a full recovery with only slight issues using the arm. Jonathan still returns to the same forest where he was attacked. And while he doesn't go alone, he will forever live with the scars and pain of the grizzly attack. The Wilson family spends their summers driving their recreational vehicle to nearby lakes to have their vacation. This time, they park their RV beside Cultus Lake in British Columbia. Today is the family's second day at Cultus Lake, and everything has been going great. This time, the family would be swimming at the lake. The father and mother, Philip and Mira, invited their three teenage children, Apollo, Jennifer, and Macy, to swim with them at the lake. Only Jennifer and Macy told their parents they'd swim with them, while Apollo refused and decided to stay inside their RV. As the rest of the family swims at the lake, Apollo plays with his phone inside the RV. He kept the vehicle's entrance open just so his family could enter any time they finished swimming or if they had to get something inside. While Apollo was playing on his phone with his headphones on, he suddenly felt the RV shake, which startled him. He thought it was an earthquake, so he took off his headphones to check it out. When the shaking stopped, he shrugged it off and put his headphones back on before playing on his phone again. As soon as he continued playing, the RV shook again. He was scared Apollo this time. He took off his headphones again and stood up from his seat, only to see a grizzly bear inside with him already. Apollo freaked out at the sight of the grizzly bear and screamed for help, as his family outside couldn't hear him that much because they were swimming at the far side of the lake. As soon as he screamed, the grizzly was also startled, making it more aggressive toward him. 
The Grizzly squeezed itself through the corridors of the RV to reach Apollo, as Apollo was screaming and was trying to take a few steps backward to avoid the bear. When the bear got closer, it immediately reached for Apollo's chest to claw it, but Apollo luckily dodged the attack and only the tip of his claws reached him. However, it still hurt his chest slightly. While swimming back to the shore to see how Apollo was doing, Philip suddenly became aware of the RV's constant shaking. Mira and the two daughters also swam back as Philip rushed inside the RV, only to see a grizzly bear trying to reach Apollo. Philip was terrified and didn't know what to do until he decided to jump at the bear's back and yank it by the ear. As Philip did so, the bear growled and moved its body side to side, shaking the RV even more. When Philip senses this would be a great chance, he suddenly gouges the bear's eyes, causing it to drop Philip on the floor and run away outside the RV. After the bear got away, Philip checked on Apollo, who the raging grizzly bear from earlier slightly hurt. They drove away from Cultus Lake afterward to get Apollo treated and swore never to return to the place again. Today's story takes us to the wild and scenic Salmon River of Idaho, cutting through the no-return wilderness and Frank Church River. It is one of the largest rivers in North America, running through 80 miles of wilderness and famous for its majestic appeal. It offers a chance for people to hunt, fish, and get away from civilization, to become immersed in the beauty of nature and all that it offers. With thick, lush forest and a thriving river flowing through it, it's a true paradise for all of the wildlife that calls this area their home. But sometimes, humans wander into territory that doesn't belong to them. When they wander out into such places, in their bid to find some fun and relaxation, they sometimes find themselves ensnared, fighting for their lives against the elements and the true landlords of the wilderness. Today, Sharon Cutler and her boyfriend Derek have decided to head out for some outdoor fun, but they choose the wrong part of the outdoors to camp, as the homeowner is not pleased with the invaders on his property. They are the largest predators in North America, and they were not willing to give a warm welcome to their guests. The couple arrived at their camping spot early, clearing the area which had been used by previous campers. They set up their tent first before heading out to the river to hunt some salmon. The young couple was carefree, more interested in the photos which they would take than in securing their environment. They took several photos by the water before they began fishing, sitting by the edge of the river while they tried to catch salmon. Unbeknownst to them, their loud noises and laughter had drawn the attention of a grizzly bear who was feeding just downstream. After fishing, they built a fire which they used to slow roast their meal, watching it cook as they took more photos. While they had the time of their lives, the grizzly watched from the shadows, staring at the couple from across the river. They were too engrossed in their own activities to see the near 600-pound creature that was watching them. The grizzly moved downstream, heading to a part of the water which it knew was shallow enough for it to cross over to the side of the river where the couple had picked as their spot. It stopped by the edge of the river, catching a salmon for itself, and munched on the small fish, making quick work of it. The grizzly's attention was then set on the humans and the sweet smell of roasted fish which filled the air. The couple spent most of the afternoon out, and by evening, they were exhausted. They returned to their tent after properly storing their leftovers in coolers, which would hide the scent. They managed to pull off some proper camp etiquette, not because they were aware of the bears, but just because they had been taught to do so. With grizzly and black bears being responsible for the death of fewer than 50 people in the United States, the chances of the couple getting attacked were low, and they were more interested in their late night frolic than anything else. It took the bear some time to make it across the river and back up the side of the riverbank to where the couple had set their tent. In the dark, the creature had to rely on its nose and keen eyesight to find them. 
Regardless of their well-stored food, the creature could still pick up on light traces in the air and followed them right to the couple's tent. Sharon and Derek had long since exhausted themselves and had fallen asleep with smiles on their faces. A day of adventure well spent, and their minds set for the morning when they would return home. As they slept, the grizzly moved through the camp. They had put the cooler off to the side of the tent, and the bear went straight for it. The determined creature clawed at it for a few seconds, trying to get the lid open, but was unsuccessful. It nudged it with the side of its head, looking to break it, but still failed to do so. Having one of the strongest bite forces in the animal kingdom, at over 900 PSI, it bit right through the box, ripping away at the layers until it got to the leftovers inside. The noise drew Sharon's attention. Quickly tapping Derek awake, they both peered through the tent to see the bear outside, feasting on what they had planned for breakfast. The bear was distracted by the food, not hearing their hushed whispers as they tried to figure out what to do. Deciding that it was best that they stayed in the tent, Sharon pulled out her smartphone and decided it would be best to take a photo. The shutter clicked and the flash went off, drawing the attention of the bear. The creature froze, turned around to face them, and let out a low roar. Sharon screamed, dropping her phone as she moved toward the back of the small tent. The bear was on them in a matter of moments, barreling into the tent and forcing the pegs to fly out of their anchor points. The tent tumbled off to the side as Sharon and Derek rolled for a bit before coming to a stop behind some bushes. The bear rushed after them, clawing and biting at the tent, trying to rip through it. Derek quickly looked around for his gun, but in the darkness, he could not find it. The tent had flipped multiple times and had left their things scattered in disarray. Sharon finally located the gun and handed it to him. Derek quickly pulled down the zipper and they both rushed out of the tent and took off running through the woods. Sharon screamed as she ran with Derek following close behind her. She tripped on a root and fell to the ground, rolling off into a ravine. Derek tried to go after her, but he tripped as well, twisting his ankle in the dark and bouncing his head off a rock. He was knocked out. The bear heard the cries of Sharon at the bottom of the ravine and began making its way down toward her, baring its teeth. She backed away in terror, feeling sand in her face, her body ached from the fall, and her elbow was painful. But she still found the strength to run. The creature slammed into her from behind, sending her back to the ground. It bit at her, catching the edge of her jeans and began pulling wildly. Sharon screamed, calling out to Derek who was still unconscious up above her. The bear realized that it was not making progress with ripping through her jeans, so it swiped at her back, slicing through her shirt with its sharp claws. Sharon screamed louder, pulling herself into a ball as she sobbed, wondering if her fate was sealed. The bear then bit down on her scalp and began pulling her away by her hair. She punched at it, but cried out from the pain in her elbow as she then realized that it was broken. The bear pulled her with such ease, it was as if Sharon was a rag doll. Just as they got near the top of the ravine, Sharon heard Derek call out to her. She screamed again, letting him know where she was. Derek rushed over to the edge of the drop-off and looked down to see the bear dragging her off by her hair. He reached for his waistline and pulled the gun from where he had tucked it. It felt strange in his hands, but there was no time for him to stop to think. He slid down the side of the hill and aimed at the large creature, right for its head. He tried to level his breathing as he did back at the gun range, making sure his aim was true. Then he pulled the trigger. The lack of feedback stunned him, and so did the bright red light that shot out of the barrel of the gun. It struck the bear right between the eyes, and the bright light of the flare stunned the creature, causing it to let go of Sharon and run off into the wilderness. Sharon had picked up the wrong gun in the panic, grabbing a flare gun instead of his pistol. But it was just enough to keep them alive. As dawn broke, medical personnel arrived at the scene, taking them both to a hospital where they would live to tell the tale. An Australian biologist named Flynn, along with his guide, Rasid, 
is on the beautiful island of Borneo to document the conservation status of the sun bear, a bear species considered the smallest in the world. The two of them are bound for the Borneo rainforest, a place known to be one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Flynn was enthusiastic about the trip and eager to learn more about the sun bears since they are quite an interesting bear species. As Flynn and Rasid are venturing into the forest, Rasid suddenly warned Flynn that sun bears can become aggressive and are relentless in their attacks. Flynn assures Rasid that he won't do anything to threaten the sun bears and that he has brought bear spray with him in case the sun bears won't be friendly to him. Rasid heaved a sigh of relief as the two of them continued to explore the rainforest, with Rasid guiding Flynn along the way. After a couple of minutes of endless walking and exploring, Rasid finally spots an adult sun bear sleeping on a tree branch above them. Rasid pointed out the sun bear to Flynn, who was amazed to know that this species of bears could climb trees just like the black bear. Flynn took out his camera to take pictures and videos documenting the sun bear. Afterward, he and Rasid were surprised when the bear suddenly woke up and stared straight down at them from above. Flynn asked Rasid if they should run, but Rasid could only stare at the bear even more to examine if it would attack them. After realizing it was only staring at them, Rasid suggested they continue their exploration to capture more footage of the sun bears. As they were walking, the most unexpected and unimaginable thing happened. In the blink of an eye, the sun bear they saw at the tree branch suddenly jumped on Flynn's back and tackled him face first on the ground. Rasid was startled as the small bear growled in anger and began clawing Flynn's back, causing him to groan loudly. Flynn tried to move his body and stand up to fight off the smaller bear, but surprisingly, it had a heavy weight that kept him pinned on the ground. Rasid wanted to get the bear spray from Flynn, which he told him about earlier, but he didn't know where to find it since the bear was all over Flynn's back. Determined, Rasid desperately grabbed a nearby tree branch that had been broken off a tree and decided to use it as a weapon against the vicious sun bear. As the sun bear kept attempting to bite and claw Flynn, Rasid immediately went near it and bashed its head with the tree branch, considering it was thick and heavy. The bear growled, got off Flynn, and this time went for Rasid. But before the bear could lay its long clawed paws at Rasid, he hits the sun bear's face with the branch as hard as he can until it collapses on the ground. As soon as the bear went unconscious, Rasid helped Flynn to get up and reported the incident to the authorities. After the incidents, the authorities searched for the sun bear that attacked Flynn and Rasid to put it in the Bornean Sun Conservative Center so that the bear wouldn't cause harm anymore and would be kept in captivity. The story for today's video takes us to Canada's largest, coldest, and northernmost region, Nunavut which is its tundra territory with a cold, remote, and craggy environment, home to 28,000 Inuit people. Many tourists are fascinated by the weather conditions and the locals' way of living here. It gained fame due to its frigid temperatures and is a popular place to catch a glimpse of the northern lights and spot unique animals such as narwhals, seals, walruses, beluga whales, and the most anticipated and feared of them all, the ferocious polar bear. People who want to view a polar bear up close and in the wild frequently travel to Nunavut. Polar bears are considered residents of this place as they can freely roam in areas where they want to. However, they are hunted down by Nunavut hunters in case they would begin to attack people, as countless cases of polar bear attacks within this territory have been recorded ever since. Given that polar bears are the strongest, most powerful, and most aggressive of all bear species, there's no surprise that they would bring terror to the residents and even tourists of Nunavut. In this video, we'll feature a horrifying true story of a woman who got attacked by a polar bear while studying beluga whales in Pond Inlet, an Inuit hamlet within Nunavut. A wildlife researcher named Aldina Moore was sent to Nunavut with 12 other researchers to study beluga whales, the sea canaries of the ocean. Since she knew about them, Aldina had been deeply interested in learning about beluga whales and would grab any chance to see and check them out up close. Aldina was mesmerized by the sight of the surroundings as Yotimo and Hanta showed them some beautiful views along their motorboat ride. 
Aldina took countless photographs of the animals and sights she and the other researchers saw while sailing to their campsite. Upon arriving at their campsite near the coast, Yotimo and Hanta helped Adina and the researchers set up their camp. There were individual sleeping bags for all researchers, a huge research tent and a table to eat, and many boxes full of food, supplies, and gear, and other essentials needed for their research expedition to study beluga whales. After doing all the work and setting up their camp, Aldina decided they should all take a rest before setting up the net they'll be using to catch a beluga whale. Once they've finally seen one, they will only take intimate photographs of its body, take blood samples, examine its behavior, and possibly record clips of its sound. After half an hour, they will release the whale with no harm inflicted. Aldina went to Yotimo and Hanta to ask about the location's conditions and whether or not it caused any hazards while resting. Hanta told Adina that there were also tourists. They led to the camp and got home safely in no time. After hearing those, Aldina was convinced that the place was completely safe. However, Yotimo warned her immediately of polar bears. Polar bears are native to these areas, Yotimo began as he spoke. Our tourists might get home alive and safe, but they also got home scared and terrified because they saw a polar bear," he added. Confused, yet filled with curiosity, Aldina began to ask Yotimo some questions. Do you have any idea what happened to those tourists? Why are they so terrified of polar bears? What did the polar bears do to them? She asked. Yotimo sighed as he pointed out a spot at a distance and told Adina to look at it. He told Adina that it was where polar bears usually go and where tourists usually saw them at some point. Adina was quite surprised at how close the spot was to their camp. Hanta assured Aldina that the polar bears go to that spot to cool down or eat food they gathered from hunting in other parts of the fjord. As long as Aldina and the other researchers won't do something that may threaten or provoke them, they'll be fine. And again, Aldina was convinced that everyone would be safe if she stuck to what Yotimo and Hanta had said. After her conversation with the two Inuits, she told the others they should start setting up the particular net they made to catch one beluga whale. Another researcher named Evan decided to carry out the plan of getting the net into the water. Together with four other male researchers, they set up the trap before steering it into the water to drop it. Once the net had been dropped, Aldina told the other researchers that they should monitor it for 24 hours a day. And to do this, they should have rotating shifts every three to four hours. The other researchers agreed as they started watching the net for signs of a beluga whale. Aldina assigned herself to do the afternoon shift, to which most researchers agreed. She took a quick nap until one of the researchers woke her up when it was finally her turn to watch the net. She sat down on a portable chair with two other researchers named Rita and Nicholas and began their shift. While watching, the three of them casually talked about polar bears instead of beluga whales. The two were curious about how big a polar bear could get while Aldina was slightly disturbed by the thought of seeing a huge predator up close. She told the other two that polar bears are highly aggressive and will not hesitate to kill. After the small talk, Aldina excused herself to go to a nearby spot as she saw two seals going to the coast. She quickly grabbed her camera and took pictures of the seals. It was a rare moment to see seals up close, and Aldina would never miss a chance to document them. Suddenly. Aldina felt something strange in her surroundings. She felt like something had been following her the entire time she's documenting the seals at the coast. She tried to look around and roam around the place to find out if something was following her or if it was just her intuition. Aldina spotted what she was trying to avoid, a polar bear. She couldn't determine if the bear was near or far from her, but she could only assume that the bear was meters away from her. Scared but still fascinated, Aldina slowly tried to take a picture of the bear when it suddenly started to walk towards her. Terrified, Aldina freaked out and decided to run for the camp, but it was too late. As soon as she started running was the moment the bear ran swiftly and caught her in its huge paws in no time. She had no idea that polar bears are this fast and quick when capturing their prey. Aldina began to scream as the polar bear immediately pinned her down to the ground and scratched her torso, causing excruciating pain. 
She tried squirming her body to escape from the huge animal, but it only caused her to end up lying on her back, giving more access to the polar bear to leave scratches and wounds on her body. Aldina once again screamed for help. The other researchers heard her this time and decided to rush to her. As the researchers were running to help her, the polar bear continued to claw Aldina's back as she was protecting her nape from being scratched despite the pain she's been feeling. After clawing at her for a while, the polar bear stopped and jumped on her body. It then stomped on her several times. When the researchers arrived at the scene, Evan brought out a rifle that he was given and aimed a shot at the polar bear. Due to the quick movements of the polar bear, it missed, but the rifle's sound was so loud that it immediately startled the animal. When Evan noticed this, he fired another shot beside the polar bear, which made it run away from them instantly, leaving Aldina conscious and wounded. They immediately called a plane to come and pick them up to take Aldina to Ikalau, the only city within Nunavut as it has a medical facility. There, Aldina received more than 400 stitches for her wounds and was provided with intense treatment to recover from her severe injuries from the polar bear attack. The research expedition that Aldina's team had been doing was canceled due to what happened. After the incident, Nunavut hunters came together at the place to hunt for the polar bear that attacked Aldina, so it won't harm any more tourists. Luckily, Aldina made it out alive and was on her way to recovery. The story is about a hiker named Eleanor Lewis and her son Caleb Lewis. Their morning journey on a Wyoming hiking trail ended in disaster. Eleanor was a hiker for more than 20 years and has been teaching her 16-year-old son Caleb for a while now. The two have been on different hiking trips, serving as their mother and son bonding. For their morning hike, they decided to go on a Wyoming hiking trail, which is famous for frequent bear sightings. At first, Caleb was skeptical about the hike as he knew that they could have an encounter with a bear later on. He suggested they bring two cans of bear spray to prepare for a potential bear attack, which Eleanor did right after being told by Caleb. As they started their morning hike, Eleanor and Caleb had a great time. They brought cameras to take pictures of the environment and footage of some wildlife they had encountered on their way. It was a peaceful morning hike until they stumbled upon a meadow and spotted a giant grizzly bear with its cubs in the distance. The two strolled in the meadow as they watched the mother grizzly take care of its cubs. Caleb wanted to turn back, but his mother Eleanor insisted they continue on the trail since the bears would follow them. Caleb grew nervous and picked up his bear spray just in case. Eleanor and Caleb tried their best to walk slowly and not make noise, as grizzly bears have excellent hearing. As unfortunate as they could get, Eleanor stepped on a pile of leaves, causing the mother grizzly to look at them. The two froze at their place instantly as the bear made eye contact with them while slowly approaching. Caleb started to scream and make noises to let the bear know that he was human, hoping to make it back away and return to its cubs. Unfortunately, the bear became agitated and began charging in his direction. They started rushing in the direction the bear was coming from out of panic. When Caleb saw the bear approaching, he charged it with bear spray before attacking his mother, Eleanor. Eleanor screamed as the bear tackled her face first down on the ground and began biting her arms and backpack. Caleb grabbed the nearest wooden stick he could find and poked the bear right in the eye, which made the bear growl in pain and get off Eleanor. The bear spray also took effect as the bear kept growling in discomfort. Seconds later, it backed away and disappeared from the two of them. Caleb helped his wounded mother stand up as the two struggled to hike back to where they had started. Even though Eleanor suffered from wounds, cuts, and lacerations from the bear's attack, she is still thankful that she could make it home alive despite the terrifying encounter.